Hey everyone, welcome to another session of Sorazzle Dazzle Physics. In today's session guys, we're going to be looking at flux time and voltage time graphs when rotating a coil within a magnetic field. And before we get going guys, make sure you hit the like subscribe button to keep my channel going and keep my content as free as possible. Before watching this video, make sure that you've watched my other videos on number one, flux, number two, Faraday's law, and number three, Lenz's law, because we need all of that theory to be able to understand this lesson here. Okay, so let's have a quick recap on what actually flux is. Okay, so over here, guys, I've got a north pole and a south pole over here, two sides of a magnet, and we've got a square coil, guys, a square coil placed within the field. First of all, the field lines go out of the north and into the south. So the field lines go out of the north and into the south over here. Here are my field lines over here. This diagram on the right-hand side is a sideways view of it. So imagine you looked at that head-on, yes, what would you see? Just looking at that head-on, you wouldn't be able to see it in 3D. You'd just see just a line representing this bit over here. Okay, guys, as you can see, I've labeled different corners of the square coil. And obviously on this diagram, you'd only see this bit being A and this bit being B. Obviously C and D is behind here. You just can't see it because it's not in 3D. So the field lines go across right now. The field lines are going across. Here we go. Here's my field lines over here. And all we're going to do is now is talk about as it rotates, what's happening to the flux. So as it rotates, what's happening to the flux? If you've forgotten, flux, guys, has the symbol of phi, which is going to be equal to the number of field lines passing through an area. If you want to, you can imagine it as the number of field lines threading going through uh, the loop here. So that's going to be the simple idea of flux, the number of field lines passing through an area. And obviously, the area we're looking at is the square coil. Uh, in terms of a formula, hopefully you remember that phi is equal to B A cos of the angle theta. Yes, where theta is the angle between the normal to the surface. So the normal to the surface is here, over there, that's the normal to the surface, and over here, in this diagram, it's over there, and um, the field over here. So I've spent an entire lesson going through this. Make sure you've watched it before watching this one over here. Right, so we have this idea that phi is equal to B A cos theta. Uh, now let's talk about as you rotate the core within the field, what happens to the flux? Well, I'm going to draw a couple of diagrams to help you visualize this. Okay, as we can see, look, we've got these points over here. So this is A and this is B at the start. So this is the same diagram over here and we're going to rotate it. So this is the start. This is when T is equal to zero, the start of the rotation. This is at the end when T is equal to the time period. You're going to make one complete rotation round. So A and B like this, then we're going to rotate it. So we're rotating it this way, everyone. So A goes to there, B goes to there, A goes to there, B goes to there. A goes to there, B goes to there, and obviously back to the start, A at the bottom and B at the top over here. So right, so look, we've done the entire motion of the square core as it rotates full circle within the field. Let's talk about the flux. So when is there the maximum amount of flux and when is there the minimum amount of flux? You'll get the maximum amount of flux when it's in this uh, orientation, when it's perpendicular to the field here. So over here, don't forget, look, you can see it, loads of lines can pass through it over here. So this will be the maximum flux. Right, this one, look, so imagine the square core is now um, like parallel to the field, you'll get the minimum amount of lines passing through it. Imagine like this, so right now, it will have the minimum amount of lines passing through it. So this one will be minimum flux over here. And then over here, as it rotates, it will be maximum flux uh, maximum flux but in the opposite direction because as it rotates round so a bit negative maximum flux then it goes back to minimum so minimum flux then once again it goes to maximum flux over here excellent stuff so now look we've got all of these bits here now let's try and get a graph then so what happens if we were to sketch the graph of flux versus time what would it look like okay so flux versus time graph so as you can see right now we've got flux on the y-axis and time on the x and look over here, the time taken for one complete oscillation is over here, That's the time period capital T over here. Right, so obviously initially you get the maximum flux, so let's put a cross over here, so you will get maximum, then it'll be going to minimum, then it'll be going to maximum of the direction, then minimum, then maximum over here. So look, we end up with this graph over here, and obviously look, obviously that's going to be a cos graph, so it makes sense. Phi is equal to B A cos theta over here. Right, but you might be thinking then, oh, hang on a minute, I thought theta was referring to the angle, it's true, but we can now incorporate time 
and into this equation. So hopefully you know that, that the angular velocity, the rate at which it spins, is equal to, uh, so omega is equal to theta divided by t. So that's the angular velocity over here, that's omega. That's theta over t. Make sure you've watched my other video on angular velocity as well if you're still struggling on that. So now we can replace uh, theta in this equation with omega t. So therefore phi is equal to b a cos open bracket omega t. And there we go, guys. We have an expression for the flux against time. There we go. And now, look, guys, it matches up with the graph we have here. Excellent stuff. Okay, now, moving on. What would the EMF versus time graph look like for this motion? What would the EMF versus time graph look like? Well, let's talk about it. Well, hopefully you can remember that we have the Faraday lenses law, that the EMF induced is equal to the rate of change of flux linkage minus dn phi divided by dt. So minus dn phi divided by tt over here, which in simple words is going to be the voltage induced is equal to the rate of change of flux linkage. The rate of change of flux linkage. Right, so in this diagram right now, it's our task right now to identify when are you going to get the greatest EMF. Well, in order to work this out, you've got to understand that you'll get the greatest EMF when there is the greatest amount of field lines being cut, or there's the greatest amount of flux cutting. I'm going to put that all down first and let's talk about it. Here we go. The greatest EMF induced when the coil cuts the greatest amount of field lines, or the flux cutting is the greatest. So you'll get the greatest EMF when there's the greatest amount of field lines being cut, or there's the greatest amount of flux cutting. Right, so first of all, that sounds like quite a mouthful, but I'll explain it using this diagram over here. So let's just talk about this bit right now. So just only look at point A. As A moves, so don't forget it's going to rotate, A is going to move like this right now. A will move this direction here. So ask yourself the following, is it going to cut this line over here? Is it going to cut this line? Well, not really. Look, a small movement of A won't actually cut the line here. So we get a minimum amount of cutting of the field lines. So this will be a minimum value of cutting, and therefore there's a minimum amount of the EMF. I'll put voltage here. So the minimum amount of voltage here. But then look, as it gets to this uh, orientation, as A moves very slightly, it's going to cut that field line because A is moving now perpendicular to the field. So we get the maximum amount of voltage being produced over here. Once again over here, when it's in this orientation, it's not going to cut that many at all. So over here, we get a minimum value of the voltage, and over here, we get a maximum value of the voltage, and over here, we then get another minimum value of the voltage here. Right, so loads of kids get confused with this because they keep getting uh, flux and voltage confused. Don't forget, you'll have maximum flux and minimum voltage, and maximum voltage when there is minimum flux. Make sure that you're happy with that. Okay, so now let's sketch the voltage against time graph, and let's see what we get. Okay, so voltage time graph. So initially, the voltage is minimum. Yes, over here, we get the minimum amount of cutting. Then we get a maximum. There's the greatest amount of cutting. Then it drops down to zero again. Then we get the maximum amount of cutting in the opposite direction. And then finally, get the minimum once again over here. So now, look, guys, you end up with this graph. Excellent. So look, one of them is a cos, and this one, you can kind of guess what we'll get over here. This one is going to be a sine graph. Okay, right, so let's try and get a formula for this one, a good expression to describe the voltage as time goes on. Uh, first of all, I just want to add something to this equation over here. This one is for only one square core. So if you had one square core, phi is B A cos omega T, but don't forget you might have multiple, so N phi will therefore be equal to N B A cos open bracket omega T over here. Right. I can then uh, use this now for this voltage expression. So hopefully we can remember that voltage is equal to minus dn phi divided by dt. Yes, so therefore it's equal to minus dn. And look, we've got phi over there. Uh, n b a cos open bracket omega t close bracket divided by dt. Right, when you're differentiating cos with respect to time, what happens is the omega pops out, guys. So you end up with the following expression. V is equal to N B A omega uh, sine open bracket omega T over here. Uh, don't forget, when you differentiate cos, you get minus sine, but because there's a minus sign over here, it therefore becomes positive. And look, it now makes sense. 
we now have a sine function to represent this bit of the graph over here. Excellent stuff. So look, we've got one expression for uh, the flux. We've got one expression now for the voltage over here. Okay, and the last point, guys, is that sometimes they might want to replace omega. You should remember that omega is equal to 2 pi divided by the time period t. And they might want to put uh, omega is also equal to 2 pi f into this equation. So this equation over here will become n phi is equal to n b a cos open bracket 2 pi f times by t and this one over here will become the voltage will be equal to n b a omega sine open bracket don't forget we're now replacing omega with 2 pi f times by t over here uh, i know that's a long formula guys and anyway, it looks quite uh, difficult the first time we look at it but hopefully it now makes sense because we've walked you through it Okay, so now we have a graph of flux against time and voltage against time. What is the link between them? How can you move from the flux graph to the voltage graph? How can you move from the voltage graph to the flux graph? Let's look at it now. Okay, so now linking the flux time graph and the voltage time graph, hopefully you can see that the way to link them is going to be uh, using uh, the Faraday lenses law. V is equal to minus d n phi over dt. Okay, right. Okay, so that's the link between both of them. So... Um, let's say we have this right now. Let's say we've got this graph over here and you're asked to sketch this graph, the voltage against time, one over here. So first of all, the gradient of this graph, so the gradient of this one, don't forget, if you were to look at the gradient of this one over here, the change in y over to change in x is going to be um, phi against time, which is going to be the voltage over here. So the gradient of a flux time graph represents the voltage. So you look over here, you've got a constant gradient, you'll get a constant voltage but it will be in the opposite direction because of the minus sign over here. So therefore, my graph, uh, let's put some numbers over here, let's just, uh, this bit of it, let's just say uh, this part over here, this will correspond to a negative voltage over here. There we go. And then the next bit, look, if you know that, look, the flux is not changing here, will you get any voltage? No, you won't. So therefore, the voltage drops down to zero. So therefore, this one becomes zero over here. There we go. So look, this is this graph over here. Make sure you're happy with that. So the gradient of a flux time graph represents the voltage over here. And obviously, if it's a horizontal line, there is no voltage that's going to be induced over here. Um, you might be asked about the area of the voltage time graph over here. What about the area of a voltage time graph? Hopefully, you can recognize that if I was to rearrange this, voltage um, times by time, is equal to the flux over here, the flux. So the area of, so the area of a voltage time graph represents the flux over here. So the area of a voltage time graph represents the flux. Make sure you're all happy with that. And there we go, guys, I've just summarized it. Look, the gradient of a flux time graph equals the voltage. Yes, yeah, so obviously that's the reason why it's zero over here. And look, when the flux time graph is not changing, the voltage is zero. But let's say somebody said to you, oh, work out the flux from a voltage time graph. It's the area. Yes, the area over here. So the area of a voltage time graph represents the flux. And that's it for another session of Surrounds Dazzle Physics. I know this is a difficult concept, guys, so make sure you go over it in detail. Make sure you look at all of it. Yes, that means in terms of the flux linkage, make sure you understand how... Uh, the voltage is induced, the flux cutting from here, you can sketch the graphs. You can also incorporate omega into here as well because don't forget theta, yes the angle, but they might want the rate of rotation and therefore the angular velocity. And don't forget you can actually move from the flux time graph and the voltage time graphs as well in order to tackle questions. And that's it everyone, we shall see you next time. Ciao, ciao and goodbye.